Okay, guys, welcome to the BTM Club in Conversation series. Those that have been following the series know what it's about. It's about the musical legends that have provided the soundtrack to our lives. So today we have a very startled looking Mr. Tashan. Yes. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm doing good, bro. Thank, thank Great you. to finally get you. Yes. Yes, my pleasure. And then we find out that Tashan and I share a name. My surname is his Christian name. There yeah. you go. <laughs> That's right. So how have you been? Uh, I've been well, bro. No, uh, no complaints, you know. I'm definitely not going to complain about anything. Uh, dealing with a lot over here, you know, in America with the COVID situation. So. Yeah, well, you know what? That situation's global, so you're not alone. Yeah, yeah. So, and, um, but musically, musically, things have been going pretty well. I've been doing a couple projects with some different producers that basically they send me in the music, um, and I write, I write something to it, go in and record it. And send okay. It so that that's going along pretty good, keeping me. Busy. Well, we've definitely missed you over the years because I was glad to remind you of "Thank You, Father" on Solid Soul. Back in 1980, wow. when when was it? Can you remember 87, 88? It was 88. Yeah. Right. Okay. Of which we were in the audience. We were regulars in the audience dancing there. And oh. um, I can remember exactly what he had on. He was there like a lion with his locks. Yeah. And he was there with his, you know, black vest and white pants. White flowing linen pants. Yeah, man. Yeah, I remember. Do you remember? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I remember, man. That was a long. That was a long time ago. That was good. I did. Uh, I, yeah. did I did. Thank you, Father, and uh, chasing a dream on that show. That day. Right. That's it. And when did bide my time come? Was that after? Read my mind. Yeah. Read my mind. Bide my time. Bide. My... Yeah, yeah, read my mind. That was on the first album, Chasing the, the Dream. First album, right? Okay. Well, thank you, Father, and Chasing the Dream are both from the same album. But yeah, right. Yeah. So tell me the Tashan journey into music. How? Where did you grow up? And how? How did it start for you? Um, were you always a New Yorker? Yeah, I grew up in Poughkeepsie, New York. Okay. Uh, born and raised in Poughkeepsie. Um, that's. Uh, Upstate New York. Um, right. I grew up in a church, Beulah Baptist Church. Okay. See, my mother, uh, Tony Graham, played piano for the gospel chorus, for the youth choir. So I grew up singing in the church as a soloist. Um, that's right. how I started. That's how I first started singing. And then um, I got into um, I got into doing commercials. Right. And, TV and stuff like that uh, through my mom. My mom has always been the number one um, inspiration for me for singing and, you know, just expressing uh, myself musically. So that's okay. where I got, I got my start at uh, singing gospel music. Right. Yeah. So it kind of started as church for you. Yes, sir. Definitely. Right. Now I'm finding that that seems to be the common denominator with most of the artists I speak to, they're always, yeah, you know, started in the church. That's right. Yeah, you know, uh, even even to this day, man, you know, it's, it's still, and, and like you said, thank you, Father. So all those years later, you know, where I, where I started still reflects uh, my belief and then, and then my, um, my dedication to always giving God the glory, not only just for my talent, but for my everyday existence. So... Right, my praise and my my um, my praise for the Lord is always extended. It's always been a part of my music. I've always incorporated it in in the songs that I write. So yeah, that that's where I started, and that's that's where I'm at right now. Right. So you started singing in church, right? Yes, sir. Okay. On um, what age was that? Uh, about seven. Right. Seven seven years old is when I actually started. Well, since my mom played the piano, you know, it was kind of like she more or less made me sing solo. You know, okay. So yeah, yeah. 
would tell me if I didn't if I didn't use my voice, then God would take it from me. So she made me sing these songs, and then um, it was it was it was it was okay for me though because I sung not only with the the, the kids my age, but I would travel with the uh, adults when they went out of town, like when they went down south. Um, right. I, I would go with them, and then I'd be the little seven year old with the suit on singing with the with the grown folks. So right, as young as seven. Sir. Yep. So when did it become apparent to you that music was going to be your path in life? Did you have any other jobs before you decided, you know what, music is the thing and nothing else? Did you do other jobs or was it always music from the beginning? Well, I think I think coming coming out of God, when I first when I went to high school, I still was singing in the um, in the church. I got. I was heavily into rap music, so I I, I got into rap. I, I started rap groups. I rap with my brother, uh, the poet. I went to college. Um, went to Howard University, and then while I was in Howard University, I hadn't really sung that much, but I had taught myself how to play the piano. So okay. Self taught with that, and then when I first composed, like my first two or three songs, uh, "Chasing the Dream" was one of them. Got the right attitude. When I first started composing songs, um, I wrote the songs, and then I then I decided that you know I, I didn't want to I didn't want to pursue a career in music as an artist. So okay. that came straight out of college. I mean, obviously, like I've had I had a lot of different jobs when I decided to move. Okay. To, when I decided when I decided to move to New York and pursue a career in music that that involved like a lot of. Uh, you know, that, that took a lot of hustle. You know what I'm saying? I had to get around the right people. Um, I met Curtis Blow. I met um, Russell Simmons. Uh, I met Jalil and uh, Houdini, Jalil and Ecstasy. Rest in peace to Ecstasy from Houdini. So once I, once I, got, once I got around that crowd of people, I wanted yeah. to be in the industry as a background singer. Right. So yeah, and Curtis Blow was actually the first guy that hired me to sing background on the Fat Boys album. Okay. So once I once I got once I did that and once I did the record with um, Houdini, uh, Yours for a Night, then I was all in after that, you know. And, right. Yeah. Okay. So was music encouraged by your family for you to pursue it, or were they like, you know, how the parents are? Come on, get a proper job. Or was it encouraged? Your mother being a pianist herself, did she encourage you to do it? Um, she she really gave me the option, but she knew that I love music. And once I told her that I, this is something that I wanted to do, she just told me to make sure that, you know, A, I got my education, but B, that if I was going to pursue a career in music, that I would take it seriously. So yeah. She was, she was greatly, she was a great influence in, in me um, committing myself to being heard because the, the, the number one thing that you have to do, I feel like as an artist, when you're trying to break into an industry like that, you have to just, you have to be on the scene. And I, I was from Poughkeepsie, which is like, you know, two hours north of New York City. So I right. had, to, had to go to New York. I had to just basically be around where the people were. And then be in the environment, being in the environment with the right people makes all the difference because as we've realized over the years, it's not just about the talent you have. It's also about the connections you have. Yes, sir. You know? Yeah. And then once, once I started getting around, once people's, the people that I worked with, once they saw that I was dedicated to it, it became a lot easier for me because yeah. I, was just, I was chasing a dream. And that, that was the premise of my whole career is the final right. the dream of being an artist, the dream of making records. And the only way I was going to turn it into a reality was to, uh, you know, to keep, to keep it soaring. Yeah, because, I mean, I think there's kind of a eureka moment where you're kind of coasting through life and, you know, just getting by and doing the things you need to do to get by. But right. then you suddenly realize this isn't what I want to do. What I want to do is this. Right. And it's that light bulb moment when it, you know, switches on in the head and says, yeah, this is what I have to pursue regardless. As they say, if you wake up in the morning and the first thing you're thinking about is that, whatever it is, that's what you've got to pursue. 
And I mean, it, it helped you as well that you were in the environment with music because your mother was a musician. Was she professional or? Well, she, she, she just, she played in the church, you know? Right. That's football. as good as professional. <laughs> you know, and, and she was multi, she played, she not only played for the senior choir, which was the, the, you know, the senior choir, but she played for the, uh, the gospel chorus, which was the, the middle-aged, um, you know, adults. And she played for the youth. Which was right. right, and she played for the the, the tinier, the, the smaller people. So she played for everybody. She played for all the different choirs in the church. Right. So, so that was inspiring. She also had other groups that she um out, outside groups that they formed and they played music. So my my number one inspiration of, of, for music was my mother. And and do yeah. you have siblings? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Are, are, are you the only bright, shining musical light, or are there others in the family that are musical and artistic and creative? No, well, I, I lost I lost my brother, uh, I lost my older brother about um, nine years ago. He, I right. rapped. Uh, he, he was a very gifted poet, you know, uh, rapper. Okay. Um, but just primarily just, and me and him did that. Um, I, I do, my in my own lineage right now, like my daughter, Eris, uh, Eris Pierce, she's an excellent vocalist. Um, okay. Excellent, excellent um, songwriter as well. So, and even even in my grandson, uh, Jet, I can see music, you know what I'm saying? Because he, 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 right. he likes to dance, he likes to play the piano, you know, just banging on the keyboard. So a lot, a lot, of, a lot of the musical talent came through. Even, even, even my, um, my mother's father, my grandfather, he taught himself how to play piano, you know? Right like jazz jazzy kind of chords whatever so i think that musically you know it's definitely a family that feels music yeah and and, and it was and, and it was primarily with gospel first initially but now you know once um like even, even now I, I i try to go branch out into all forms of music you know since i've been since i've been a recording artist you know i've recorded house music um i've done uh hip-hop R&B, soul, I've even done rock and roll. So to me, uh, my, uh, um, I just, I just basically you try diversify to diversify and yeah, just express all forms of, of how I can right. musically. It doesn't matter how I, um, how I approach it. I, I just use my voice in as many ways as I can, you know, be it from soulful to rock to ballad, to ballads to chronic. Okay. Just, yeah. A lot of my different influences of music. I like to incorporate all of them together. So what was your first big hit? Um, I'm going to have to say Read My Mind. It was Read My Mind. I, I, yeah, I thought so. Because um, that song was like the most well-received, especially over in uh in, in the UK. That song, yeah. that song was probably the most well-received song. Chasing a Dream uh, as well was... Um, was was a lot of people like that, but I think I think the song that mostly captured people's um, attention was "Thank You, Father." That's what I, I think personally. Okay, on, on more a, so than "Read My Mind." Well, you know, "Read My Mind" for you know for the people that were in the, were in the clubs that were dancing, but I think "Thank You, Father" had a, a maybe like a more deeper deeper meaning for those people to understand. Oh, it definitely had a deeper meaning and. Strangely enough, a completely different sound from Read My Mind. It had a completely different sound. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, I, I like to think that it was probably like a, one of the very first contemporary gospel records, right, for that time, because it wasn't yeah. like 85. So, yeah. So then to us in the UK, more often than not, you guys are still doing stuff, involved in projects and creating. But to us in the UK, it seemed like Tashan came, did two tracks and then disappeared into the sunset. We couldn't hear from Tashan again. <laughs> what was happening in that period? Well, I mean, I did release another album, uh, On the Horizon. Right. It had uh, Black Man and Save the Family on it. That okay. Was- that was too, that was that was well received as well. And then the, the last album I made commercially for record labels was for the sake of love. So yeah, I'm, I'm not familiar with that album or not, but I recorded that album in England. Right. 
So yeah, more often than not, the artists, they're still doing stuff, but, but we might not get it overseas mm. and, and hear about it. But you know, more often than not, you guys are still always creating. And how are you finding coping with the change in the music industry? Because it has changed considerably now from it was back in the 70s and 80s. And what I found is a lot of artists are having to create and develop their projects independently. Is that what you're doing at the moment? Oh, uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, right. I mean, you know, you gotta understand, like I, I came through in an era of AR people, you know, yeah. uh, the, the whole music industry machine, the way people are signed. Now, now, now it's a whole, it's a lot different. Uh, with technology, people are able to um, create their own music at, at home or in their home studios. So I don't have a home studio, but I, have, I do have a, a, a base studio that I work out of on a regular basis. Right. Um, and then you just basically have to fund uh, fund your own projects. Like, you know, you pay pay for your studio time, record. And that's the thing, you know, it's that's the difference. You don't, with how the industry has changed, you don't seem to have the support simply because you haven't got the big record companies behind you as you did. You have to kind of fund everything independently. That must be much harder. Yes, no? No, I think I think we're breaking up a little bit. Can you still hear me? Oh, can I can you? hear you clearly. I uh, can hear you clearly. I understand what you're saying because it's it's just well, even even when I was on a major record label, I didn't get I didn't I didn't feel like I got the maximum amount of promotion of support. Yeah, I mean it is what it is. I mean, I think yeah. that for the people that my music did reach, you know, it fulfilled the purpose. They got, they, they got, um, they enjoyed it. They got something from it. So yeah. that was, that was basically all I needed to just keep going, moving forward. Yeah. So what is Tashan up to now? Because I've heard from your manager who happens to be a very old friend of mine. Right. He won't like me saying old. Should I say a friend that I've known a long time? <laughs> Not an old friend. Oh, yeah. um, he, he's told me that you've got some new projects going on at the moment. So let's hear about that. Let's hear about Tashan's current journey. Well, I think that um, I think there's something that be, would be very interesting for, for you and for your, your viewers and your listeners to know about is um, I, I had a, I would, I was a, participated in a documentary that was just released in Black History Month of this year, February. It's called uh, Song for Our People. Okay. Yeah, you can find it. It's, it's Song for Our People, directed by Mustafa Khan. Actually, what that is is, is a, a documentary of a live recording in the studio where he right. brought together a lot of very socially conscious artists to record a song about um, to record a song about paying homage to our ancestors. Right. And so the, the premise of the film. The premise of the film, the premise of what the song was about is that he said that, you know, we as black people, when we when we go to heaven, that there's not going to be like um, St. Peter waiting for us at the at the pearly gates. But it's, instead, it's going to be a group of our ancestors. Right. And they're going to ask us, what have we done with our freedom? So that, that that's what that that's what okay. that's about. What, what what do you do? Being, being sons and daughters of former slaves, like here in America, right, and people black for the black people in England as well, we all come from the same people. Mother, so, that's right. We all come from the same mother. So the question is, is that because we have freedom, what have we done with our freedom? What do we do with our freedom? Our, you know, what, how are we moving forward? How are we um. How are we utilizing the fact that we can express ourselves? How, how are we building up um, our communities, building up ourselves, and building up our future for the ones for the generations that are coming after us? So, Song for Our People is on Amazon Prime. I think it's on Tubi. I just think that that's that's something that I'm very proud of. That I was blessed to be a part of that project. Um, I do act, and I as well. I do actively still. Uh, make songs available through my website, uh, Tayshawn7.com. You know, so let's have that website again because it's better if you say it than me. 
Tayshawn7.com. T-A-S-H-A-N. Tayshawn7.com. And that's where we can find all of your music and all of your projects. Yes, sir. Yeah. Is the documentary film also there um, on your website? There's a link. There's a link on on the um. There's a link on the site where you can just click the link and go watch it. Great. So, okay. What I what I'll do is that I mean I basically I, I can I'll move it around. I'll move the site around after this interview. I'll move I'll move that particular link and that so, stuff about song for our people uh, to the top so it'll be easier. Song for our people. Yeah. So musically, what are you doing now? Um. Musically, right now, I'm working on this track that I got from uh, a producer out of Italy named Leo Stella. Okay. Um, it's kind of like a, a retro 80s kind of track. So I'm just vibing with that right now. I'm going to write some lyrics to it, record that, send it back to him. So, yeah. Yeah, well, you know, out of Italy came two of the greatest soul bands, Change and bb and q and they were from the, the producers from Italy and New York. And so Italy does seem quite connected with our music, soul music. Yeah. And they, I think that they're, they're deep, I think they're deeply rooted in the 80s sound too. You know, yeah. The sound, 80s yeah. And 80s so yeah. Um yeah, that's that's basically all I'm basically I haven't really I haven't really started. I have some songs, some instrumentals that I have to start a new, to start a new record. But right. I just haven't really fully gotten into that um, at the moment. But um, so we won't be seeing Tashan in the UK anytime soon. Not yet. We're working on it. You know, me, me and Trevor are working on that part of it right now. I mean, that it, it's a must. You've got to come to the UK and perform. You've still got your fan base here. They still want to hear what you're doing, and you've got a UK manager. Come on, make it work. Make it happen. <laughs> Well, it's it's funny because um, I first when I first met Trevor, um, you know, I was recording the For the Sake of Love album, which right? Is Twenty years ago, but the 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 beauty of that part is that um, Trevor was was filming. You know what I'm saying? So we okay. basically basically made the agreement, and then that's how we became close. That's how we became friends still to this day. But we recorded the whole process of me making that For the Sake of Love album. So right. we're work on trying to, to bring that forward so people could just see what that experience was like. So um, when was that done? Um, 1993, early 90s. Wow, as long as that. Yeah. Wow. And then, but see, this, to me, at that time that we were making it, you know, it did documentaries, you know, people have made documentaries, but at the time that we were making it, that was the first time me really experience what it was like to have a camera follow you around. So, but after, after a certain couple of weeks, you just don't pay it any mind, but it was able, we were able to document the whole interaction between myself, the musicians, um, the yeah. producers. Um, we even had the London Symphony Orchestra play, come in and play on that album. So it's just, it's just one of the, it's just one, a project that's, that's very dear to both of us. And, and that was shot in the UK, not the US. No, in the UK. When I, I lived in England for, for that time period when I made that. Right. And so it's been shelved all this time. The filming has been shelved. The, well, the footage, I should say. Yeah. So I just think that, you know, just for, this, for, for nostalgia's sake and for the, for the sake of, like, just bringing something to light that people would be able to see. It's, just, it's more of an inside look as to how a record is actually made, you know. Right always get a chance to see that there's there's a lot of that in song for our people but it kind of correlates to what we had done before back then and how long is the documentary how much footage have you got oh uh, jeez you have to ask trevor that point. <laughs> I, I know i know he did a lot of work bro so you know and that's yeah. gonna take a lot of work to it's gonna take a lot of work to put it all together but i just i just wanted to, to, to let you know that's how far me and trevor go back you know yeah that's, well, I mean, that's 28 years that footage has been shelved. Yeah, and as they say, nothing happens before it's time. So right. maybe this is the time for that footage to be viewed by the public. Yeah, and I, I think it's, it's it, you know, it, it's historical to me because it goes, it goes to show like live musicians, 
you know, a, 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 a black R&B artist from America coming to England to make the record in England. You know, right. So work, working with British musicians and I just think I think it'd be I think it would be interesting, you know, for people. To Brilliant. See. Well, Trevor has just messaged me to say there's 90 hours of footage. Oh, jeez. <laughs> That's gonna take some getting through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's condense it all down. And, and, and yeah, and, yeah. And the the other documentary, "Song for Our People." How long is that? Um, "Song for Our People" is uh, one hour. One hour. Yeah, okay. Directed by a um, gentleman named Mustafa Khan. So ba ba if you like, if you type it in on your search engine, song for our people. Um, yeah. Yeah, documentary, it'll pop up. But uh, yeah, that, that was. What I'm finding is in the last week alone, I have attended and interviewed so many musicians that have gone the documentary route. It's almost as if, you know, we're realizing this story needs to be told. It's not necessarily going to be read because people are not writing things or writing things down. But the visuals, people, their attention span, and they can tell stories much better with the visuals. But it's just such a coincidence that in the last week I have attended and interviewed three people that started off as musicians and are still in the music industry and have gone the documentary route. They haven't given up music, but it's almost as if they felt, well, I'm not getting what I need to get out there just with my music. I need to tell it in another format. Well, I think, I think Barry, I think that's a good way for an artist to not only, um, you know, document um, you know how much work they put into their career into their music but it's also a way for it to have you know to document what it is that happened at the time that it happened so it's a good way to keep track of what yeah. you and then people people always find I, I find it I find it um I'm very interested when I when I look at documentaries from the 60s and the 70s and on artists you know I watched the one on Barry Barry White the other day um I love the ones that I always see on Jimi Hendrix. Like it just gives you a sense of being in that moment at that time. Yeah. And I mean, though, if you are a good writer, you can transport the reader to that time. Yes. But it's much easier with the visuals. Yes. It's much easier with the visuals. Yeah. And, and you see the interaction between the people. And it, you just, yeah, I think it's a great idea. You get a whole vibe of the essence of the time, the energy, what was going on, the feelings, you know, politically as well as relationships, etc., between people. So the visuals are very important. And you're lucky to have filmmaker, producer Trevor Kelly as your manager. So he will manage that 90 hours of footage very well. Yes, I have, I have, I have great faith in him that he will. Yes, yeah. Please. Well, it's been wonderful to hear your story. Thank you for taking the time out to speak with us here at the BTM Club. It's good to see, I don't want to say an old face. I prefer to say a familiar face. Uh, you know, hey, you just try to, you gotta just try to take care of myself, you know. I, I got a lot of grades here, here and there, but I'm just thankful for each day. You know, the main, the main thing, Barry, I would like to say to all of, all of the, all the people that that, that are follow follow BTM Club and everything is that um, the one thing that has always sustained me uh, throughout my life is just that my I, I like to stay grateful. My gratefulness, you know, I've, all, I've always I've always been grateful each and every day of my life. You know, from from the same from where I became from where I first started as a young man to where I am now as you know a father a grandfather, I still give God the glory. You know, what I'm saying thankful for the talent that he has given me thankful for the people that have been able to uh, enjoy and share that talent. And um, I just, I'm thankful for it. I just want to keep going, uh, fulfill my potential, just keep going uh, and hopefully make more, more, more great music. You know, I look forward to that. And um, I really appreciate, appreciate you inviting me and uh, doing this interview. Absolutely. Because you are one of the music icons from the eighties that was part of the soundtrack to some of the best times in our life. So you know, it's only fitting that somebody like you 
be here to talk to us. I mean, really, it's just a question of, yeah, I think these stories, and I, I kind of always conclude my interviews by saying, I think these stories need to be told. You know, you guys need to talk to us and, and let us hear you and let you know that you still have followers that are interested in your music, your journey, and what you are about to produce. Yeah, that's a, that's a blessing, Barry. That's, that's very inspirational to know that people still support me um, and look forward, you know, to, to, uh, to more music from me. So I'm yeah, very the very good thing that you said is that you live in gratitude. And I think that makes all the difference to the quality of life that you have when you're in gratitude, grateful for what you've got, appreciative of what you've got, rather than existing with an entitled attitude, you'll always be dissatisfied because you'll always think you should have more. So, right. you know. You can't go wrong. You can't go wrong from that point of view, bro. I mean, yeah. thank you. And, and then considering, considering the type of world that we live in right now, you know, I lost a very close friend of mine, uh, Dave Burnett, to COVID-19 in the beginning of the year. So, you know, it's just... It's just I think we I think we're in a time and an age right now that people um, have to come back. If you had that type of upbringing, but people have to just be more focused and more grateful and humble, that yeah. and, and, and appreciative of life on a daily basis. Yeah, uh, yeah. So I'm, I'm just I'm, I'm very thankful, bro, to meet you, uh, to talk with you, and uh, yes, it's lovely to see you and. We go all the way back to Solid Soul, bro. When you told me that on the phone, I was like, wow. You know That's I mean? right. Yeah. So we were there in real time. That's what I mean. You right. know, and when I say you're talking to people that are emotionally and financially and spiritually involved in the journey, that's exactly what I mean because we were there in real time. We were there seeing you with your locks like a lion and your black vest and your white linen pants. You know, we, we were there in real time. So we know what it feels like to be a part of it. And yes, it's a pleasure. Here we are all these years later. So there we are. That's right. Nothing before it's time. <laughs> Thank you, bro. Yes. you take care. All the very best with the new project. And we look forward to seeing song for our people, and the 90 hours of footage that Trevor is about to edit. <laughs> I feel sorry for him. <laughs> no, no, yes, bro. And then and at any time, any time, please visit um, Tashan7.com. That's right. Tashan7. You heard it from the horse's mouth, people. Tashan7.com. You can get all of his information and projects there. Yeah, Thank you very much. Thank you very much, bro. All the very best and lovely to see you. Take care. Yes, bro. Peace. Bye now.